What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back to review Emerald Fennell's new movie, Saltburn, which is playing in limited release right now, and it'll be going wide in the United States on November 22nd. But this is her first feature since making her directorial debut in 2020 with Promising Young Woman, for which she won a damn Oscar for her screenplay. And I imagine this movie is going to excite a lot of debate as well, but for very different reasons. And I should warn you that the latter part of the movie could easily be ruined if you read up on the movie ahead of time. So I'm going to avoid any plot specific details until I give you a fair warning. And I'll include a time code in the description below for that section. And before I go any further, I'll just come right out and say it. I much prefer Saltburn over Promising Young Woman. And that might end up being the minority opinion, but we're gonna have to wait a few weeks to know for sure. But I think the visual style of Saltburn is much more sophisticated. I think the story's more subtle. I think we see clear evolution on her part as a director. Because the mood and the atmosphere are just absolutely first rate. And I personally love the final third of the movie, but I suspect it's that final third, that last act, that's going to divide a lot of audiences pretty dramatically. I think some people are going to adore the twists and turns, and others are going to feel like the last part of the movie totally betrays what came before. But we don't all have to agree. Discussing movies would be really fucking boring if we all saw eyeball to eyeball on every movie. But if you haven't seen the trailer... The story is set in the early 2000s, initially at Oxford, where a young student named Oliver, played by Barry Keoghan, now quick interruption, I've heard a wide range of pronunciations of his last name from Keegan to Keoghan to, anyway, there, there's a wide range of interpretations of his name out there, but I watched a video with Barry where he pronounced it Keoghan, and even he acknowledged he might be mispronouncing his own last name, but in Ireland, those names are... Um, very elusive for us uh, unsophisticated Americans. I'm going to call him Keoghan. If you don't like that, well, I can't do anything about it. At any rate, his character Oliver develops a bit of an obsession with this aristocratic heartthrob named Felix, played by Jacob Elordi. And if you've seen him in Euphoria and you have a thing for hot young guys, you're going to understand. But Felix is one of those guys that everybody wants to get close to. Plus, his family, they own a goddamn castle. So when he's out on the town and hitting the pub with his friends and that sort of thing, pretty much all it takes is a little light smack on the bun by his character and beautiful women would just leap into bed with him, a prospect that may or may not be of interest to Keoghan's character. Whether or not he simply loves him or is in love with him is a big part of the movie. It's a big question about the movie. And what makes Felix and his lifestyle all the more interesting or enticing to Oliver is the fact that Oliver is a scholarship student and he has a troubled background. And so Felix basically decides to kind of take him under his wing by inviting him to spend the summer at Saltburn, his family's palatial estate where all day, every day, his family and friends, they basically indulge in every whim without a care in the world. They're very eccentric. They all love drugs and alcohol and they love having uh, esoteric conversations and that sort of thing. And it's on this estate where we're introduced to Felix's sister played by Alison Oliver. The parents are played brilliantly by Rosamund Pike and Richard E. Grant. I think if you're a fan of Rosamund Pike, she is particularly good in this movie. And we also have Felix's best friend and relative played by Archie Madekwe, who's spending the summer there as well. And I have to admit I was a little harsh on Archie in my review for Gran Turismo back in August, but he's much better here and I think he's much better fit for character-driven dramas instead of of blockbusters and we also have Carrie Mulligan back in action as well in quite a different role from what she played in Promising Young Woman. But I have to pause for a second and just acknowledge that Barry Keoghan or Keon or Keegan or however you choose to pronounce this last name, I'm going to call him Keoghan, but he has just been going from strength to strength for the last few years and he's putting together a pretty remarkable filmography in a very short period of time. And he's only 31 years old. He's probably too old to be playing a, um, a young student at Oxford and also he has one of those faces where he's kind of prematurely old with a lot of like, you know, kind of like details and lines to his face. He does not look like an 18 year old boy. He looks 31, like going on 50. But if you set aside his, uh, his appearance, his filmography is just incredible. What he's done over the last 10 years is nothing short of remarkable. I mean, last year he had the Banshees of Anna Sharon where he was absolutely incredible. He had a brief little cameo in uh, The Batman. He appeared in Eternals, a movie which I didn't particularly care for, but anyway, it was a big Marvel movie. Uh, he was in the TV show Chernobyl. He was in Dunkirk, working with Christopher Nolan. He was in The Killing of a Sacred Deer, working with Yorgos Lanthimos, one of the best directors in the world. And I think that's the movie where people really started to take notice of him. But as far as like young actors are concerned or actors in their early 30s, I think he's one of the finest actors out there. And like I said, he keeps going from strength to strength. And who knows, he might continue to do great work for like the next 40, 50 years. So what can we say about this movie without giving anything away? I think two words come to mind when I think of this flick. 
first would be vicious. I mean, a lot of these characters can just be absolutely mercilessly cruel to one another, and they just say the most withering things about one another and always kind of plotting and scheming against each other. And at any rate, if you like seeing really rich people kind of ripping the wings off flies, Saltburn will absolutely give you your fix on that front. And I'd say the movie's also intensely homoerotic. And while that's not necessarily the kind of movie that I want to see, if that is your thing, you're going to be delighted by this flick. I think the most likely fan of this movie is going to be author Brett Easton Ellis. I listen to his podcast all the time, and he has spoken at length many times about the show Euphoria and how he finds Jacob Elordi very easy on the eyes. And after seeing this movie, which is basically like a two-hour highlight reel of Jacob looking as alluring as he possibly can, I don't want to hear people talk about the male gaze ever again, because if anything, the female gaze is just as, um, I guess, uh, avaricious or predatory or hungry, because clearly as a filmmaker, Emerald Fennell, she gets off on watching hot guys kind of fight or argue or flirt or, you know, basically there's just a lot of homoerotic tension. I won't say this movie is like softcore porn or anything like that. And I don't think there's anything wrong at all with filmmakers and or photographers acknowledging that they like to photograph beautiful people. I mean, take, for example, someone like Brian De Palma. Brian De Palma made an entire career basically out of photographing beautiful women in very dangerous scenarios. Or Alfred Hitchcock loved photographing beautiful women in dangerous scenarios. And here we just have the equal an opposite phenomenon by director Emerald Fennell, who likes to photograph men gazing longingly at Jacob Elordi. And I'm all too aware of a very vocal minority out there that absolutely is shocked by, horrified by, and frowns upon any form of sexuality in film and television. I don't know where this movement started or where it's going to end, but they're very chaste, they're very celibate, they're very judgmental, and they love wagging their finger in disapproval, and I'm just in the complete and total opposite camp. I feel like if filmmakers want to photograph beautiful people flirting, fucking, doing whatever, more power to you, life is short, make the films that you would want to see. But I must admit that I completely misjudged this movie in advance. I thought this movie was going to have a, a serious axe to grind and have a, a clear agenda about money and class and wealth disparity and that sort of thing. I mean, you're dealing with a very poor student living a summer in this like, you know, in this environment where the only thing people are worried about on a day-to-day -day basis is like picking which pond they want to lounge by as they smoke cigarettes and read books while looking cool, all while talking about you know whatever party they might be throwing that evening and what kind of suit of armor they might be wearing. I mean, these are people who do not have a concern in the world. And I thought the movie was going to turn into one of those kind of like eat the rich diatribes. And who knows, maybe there'll be some people out there who will go to this flick expecting or craving one of those eat the rich diatribes. And then they'll be frustrated if they don't hear some sort of like Marxist screed, you know, very vividly pronounced throughout the flick. But whether you're actively craving this movie to have an agenda or you're afraid that it might have an agenda, I think uh, both camps will be very surprised by the direction that the story ends up going. And I think one of the more observant aspects of this movie is showing how there's an impulse in some extremely rich people to kind of take poor people under the wing as like a project or like a pet. But if that pet says or does anything at any point that their wealthy benefactor might disapprove of, they will be completely, totally, like casually discarded and forgotten about. And so getting back to just the whole vicious angle of this movie, whether you're talking about Rosamund Pike's character or Richard E. Grant or Jacob Elordi, the viciousness runs deep in this flick, but I like vicious movies, so I was uh, totally down with that aspect of the film. But I also need to give a shout out to cinematographer Linus Sandgren, who did an incredible job of just photographing this estate. And also they shot it in this uh, 1.33 to 1 aspect ratio, which is that very classic kind of academy ratio that was used in the, like, the 30s and 40s and that sort of thing. And maybe they did that very deliberately in order to avoid comparisons to films like Last Year at Marienbad and some other kind of famous films that also explore similar terrain. But there's a very clear overt style and aesthetic to this movie. A lot of just floating cameras wandering through all the chambers of this incredibly exotic house filled with priceless artifacts. And I think for people who just enjoy wealth porn. It's going to be an absolute feast for the senses, but don't get me wrong, it's not one of those shows like Downton Abbey. It's not one of those Edwardian dramas where people are sitting around talking about engagements and drinking tea and looking after their house. And I should also add that the film was shot at the Drayton House in Northamptonshire. I hope I'm saying that correctly, but it had never been used in filming before and it might not ever be used again. And apparently a part of the contract with the film was that no one was allowed to reveal the location of the house or the identity of the owners. And according to an interview with Fennell, basically 
of the crew just lived there because she didn't want to have to constantly pick up and go. She has this line on Wikipedia where she says, it was important to me that we were all in there together, that the making of the film in some way had that feeling of a summer where everyone loses their minds together. I didn't want to be constantly picking up and moving. And I'm sure there can be some lunatics out there who see this movie and just become irate, like, oh, it's two hours of unacknowledged privilege, yada, yada, yada. But I feel like if you have an eye for subtlety and you have an eye for nuance, you probably will find some uh, pretty withering criticisms kind of you know, laced within the movie or kind of woven into the movie. But it's not a movie that's going to beat you over the head with a sledgehammer saying like, this is what we're trying to say. You're going to have to uh, go looking for it. And I feel like a, a good movie should be a little more ambiguous. But I don't want to give the impression that I think Saltburn is some perfect film or some masterpiece. I was into it. I was engaged. I thought it was a very, an incredibly stylish, stimulating aesthetic experience. And that is what I crave from movies. I crave the most intense aesthetic stimulation that a movie can possibly deliver. But if I were to criticize this movie, I would say that it borrows pretty heavily from two very famous adaptations of one particular book. But because this is my non-spoiler section, I won't say what that book is or what those adaptations are. But maybe now's as good a time as any to get into my spoiler section and acknowledge that there's a major plot twist about two-thirds of the way through the movie. And I think half the audience is going to be like, oh, you lost me. And the other half is going to be like, oh, thank God, finally we have some plot to kind of sink our teeth into. So let's get into the big reveals, the big spoilers, and this is my last warning. If you don't want to hear any details about where the story goes, bail out now. But I think one of the main criticisms, as well as one of the things that I liked most about this movie, is that it borrows pretty heavily from, whether that was deliberate or not, from the book The Town of Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith. And Patricia Highsmith obviously wrote a lot of books, many of which have been adapted by some of the best filmmakers of the last like 75 years. But Town of Mr. Ripley was initially adapted into the movie Purple Noon back in 1960, which is absolutely incredible, and then was adapted again in 1999 with Matt Damon. And I think the relationship between the Jude Law character and the Matt Damon character in uh, the 1999 adaptation is very similar to the relationship between Barry Keoghan and Jacob Elordi in Saltburn, where you've got one guy who kind of craves becoming a part of the aristocracy, but at the same time is also very clearly, you know, sexually aroused by and obsessed with this young aristocrat who doesn't have a care in the world. And while Keoghan's character, Oliver, has slightly different motivation or slightly different goals and ambitions in this, it's still very similar where it's like, I love you, I'm obsessed with you, I want to be you, but I very well might have to kill you at a certain point and take everything that belongs to you. But uh, people have short memories. I think a lot of young film goers now, they've probably never heard of The Town of Mr. Ripley or Patricia Highsmith, although they should. I mean, Patricia Highsmith, some of her books have been turned into movies like Carol and whatnot. She's absolutely incredible. And Alfred Hitchcock absolutely adored her work and turned her first novel, Strangers on a Train, into one of his best movies. And so I think the big question for a lot of people is going to be, do they resent the fact that this very moody, atmospheric, very loose, improvisational, character-driven drama suddenly transforms into a very plot-driven like, murder mystery in the final third. And like I said, I think some people be like, fuck you, you've betrayed everything this movie I had established ahead of time. I was expecting quite a different experience. And they just, they'll mentally check out. And I think other people are going to be like, oh, what a relief. We finally have some plot. We have some story. We have some drama. We have some violence. You can only watch people lounging by the pool, smoking cigarettes and talking about nothing for so long before something needs to happen. But another reason I think the final act is going to alienate some people, as it turns out, Oliver is not poor at all. He's very much resoundingly middle class. He's got a big, healthy family that loves and adores him. He's got two, two happy parents in spite of the story that he's been uh, sharing around school. And he's got three sisters who would love to spend time with him, but he just avoids his family like the plague. But as we learn, he's just a middle class guy who wants more. He craves wealth and power. And I think a lot of people are going to suspect going into this movie, given the nature of uh, the director's previous movie, that this movie is going to have a serious axe to grind about you know, the lower class kind of like fighting and destroying the upper class. But it's not that drama whatsoever. He's not some oppressed victim. He's just a well-to-do kid who just craves much more. And I think because this movie denies them that class warfare angle, I think some people are going to be like, what? No, like that's what I wanted from the movie. It's a serious pump fake. It's a serious bait and switch where the movie suddenly just turns into like a psychological thriller or an erotic thriller. And I love erotic thrillers and I love psychological thrillers. I grew up in the 80s and the 90s where we were feasting on those kinds of movies all the time. They're incredibly popular. 
But once again, I think this movie is going to be very hotly debated because there are going to be some people that absolutely love and adore this movie. I think there are going to be a lot of um, young women and young gay men where they don't even care like how the movie like resolves itself. They're going to be so turned on by Jacob Elordi's character that they're not going to really be willing to concede or acknowledge any of the, any of the movie's flaws. So... I'm really curious to see how people are going to react to it. I think on Rotten Tomatoes right now, it's around like 80%, which seems more or less fine. Like, once again, anytime I see a movie that's at like 98% or 99 I get very suspicious because I, I hate groupthink. I can't stand it when everybody's on the same page about whether or not a movie's great or whether or not a movie sucks. Like, if we don't get to talk a little shit and kind of angrily debate movies from time to time, once again, discussing movies would get incredibly boring. So... I'm going to recommend that people see Saltburn and decide for themselves. I think it's well worth watching. It's got fantastic performances. It's got style to spare. And no matter what movies Emerald Fennell makes moving forward, I will be there on day one, first in line. I think she's got tons of potential, tons of talent. And who knows, we might be at the beginning of a very long and fruitful and prolific career. Fingers crossed. I mean, once again, movies are a commercial art form. People do need to buy tickets and see her flicks. But I'm recommending that people throw down their cash, check out this flick and decide for themselves whether or not the ending works. But I think that's all I've got to say for now, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this video. Thank you so much for listening to my rant. I greatly appreciate it. Please consider subscribing to the channel, liking the video, hitting that notification bell. But I hope everybody has a great week, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.